very good evening to all our wonderful participants. Thank you for your patience and a warm welcome. Uh, Mocha invites you to this session on uh, the Sari Weaves and Drapes of India by Ninoshka Alvarez Delene. Ninoshka will be exploring the various traditional weaves across India, the Sari being a versatile garment. We will be discussing uh, the Noshka will be discussing the various drapes across the Indian subcontinent, both traditional and adaptations to suit modern needs. Ninoshka is a national award-winning fashion designer from Goa, whose label Ninoshka focuses on sustainable fashion. She's an alumnus of Soft Pune and Nift Mumbai. She works closely with handloom weavers and embroidery artisans from across India and aims to create social improvement and environment awareness through her work. Welcome, Ninoshka, and we are so eager to know more about the sari. Over to you. Thank you, Natasha. Thank you so much for having me here today and uh, allowing me to speak about something I'm very passionate about. Um, okay, so... I'm still trying to figure this out. Okay. So, hi everyone. Good evening. Uh, I'm Nanoshka. I'm the creative director of my eponymous label, which is centered around um, sustainable fashion. And besides working with natural fabrics and dyes, I work with traditional crafts. 98% of the designs I make are from hand woven fabrics. And um, I, I've been in the fashion industry since 2005. And during the course of my experience, I've had the privilege of working not only with some of the top personalities in India, but also some of the most gifted craftspeople in India. So what we'll be talking about today is um, during the next hour or so, I'd like to take you on a journey to throughout India as far as the sari goes. And uh, we will look at the beautifully crafted weaves of India and the drapes from each part of the country and how they are apl applicable to each state and culture. Now, since we have very little time, the, the subject is very, very vast. And if I go on talking about the drapes as well as the weaves, uh, then you know one hour is not enough. So I will just touch upon the most, uh, some of the most exquisite drapes and the most popular ones, and sorry, the most exquisite weaves and the popular ones, as well as the drapes. So most people, when they think of sari, they, they think of Indian women. And whenever they think of Indian women, they imagine uh, them in a traditional sari. So traditionally, a sari is a handwoven piece of unstitched fabric with heavier sections in its part to help it drape correctly. But um, in today's day and age, its definition extends to include uh, textile woven by mill or by hand, often with one consistent density. Uh, the term sari has also evolved to become inclusive of contemporary materials, including cotton, silk, and synthetic fibers. Um, this is this later point is contentious to sari purists because um, the reality is that millions of women wear 100% polyester sari saris today, which are far cheaper than the handwoven ones. The length of the sari can range anywhere between 3.5 yards to 9 yards, depending on its intended drape. There are essentially three parts to a sari. Uh, one is, the main part is the body, which is usually plain and lightweight, and it allows it to drape well around the body. Um, then you have the border, which is the edges or the hem of the sari. It is denser than the rest of the sari in order for it to fall well when worn. Women often attach another piece of fabric uh, to, the, to the bottom border, which is called a fall, uh, to increase the weight of the fabric. However, this is not required in traditional handwoven saris. Then you have the pallu, which is 
the most decorative piece of the sari and is usually the heaviest part of the sari and it helps the fabric fall when it is worn. At times, uh, an 80 centimeter to one meter additional fabric is woven into handwoven saris as a blouse piece, which can be cut apart and sewn into a sari blouse. The textile sector is actually the second largest industry in terms of employment in India. So nearly 22% of cloth production in the country comes from the handling sector. Um, so there are about, there, there are over 3 million sari handlooms uh, weaving families in, in India and in households in India. And a sizable portion of the handloom and embroidery sector uh, weaves saris. The saris uh, is the one piece of clothing that unifies the country from north to south. Every state in India has its own unique uh, textile and its indigenous sari weave. And so we'll just, I'll just be covering a few of the sari weaves today. I'd like to start with the Banarasi sari. It originates from modern day Varanasi, which was known as Banarasi at one point of time, uh, which is in UP in Uttar Pradesh. It is undoubt it's undoubtedly one of the most exquisite and rich saris that are woven in India. It is known for its elaborate, uh, elaborately ornate with heavy gold and silver brocade or zari, fine silk and opulent embroidery. The Banarasi sari is a popular choice for bridal pusos. Uh, they were introduced in India by the Mughals and hence a Mughal inspired design such as intricate intertwining floral motifs, net like patterns, architectural designs, along with figures of animals in gold or silver are common. Depending on the intricacy of its designs and patterns, a sari can take anywhere from 15 days to six months to complete. And the price range of a Banaras sari depends on the intricacy of work. The pure uh, Banasi silk sari can start anywhere from four and a half thousand and can go up to lakhs because of the real gold and silver zari threads used in it. Over the years, the Banarasi silk handloom industry has been facing competition from mechanized units produ producing the ban Banarasi silk sari at a faster and cheaper rate in cheaper synthetic alternatives to silk. And also increasing quantities of lookalike Banarasi saris have been produced in China and are flooding the market. In 2009, the Weaver Association in Uttar Pradesh secured the GI indication, that's a geographical indication rights for the Banaras brocade saris. That means that no sari or brocade made outside the six identified districts in Uttar Pradesh can be legally sold under the name of Banarasi sari or brocade. Another sari that I personally like is uh, the Kota Doria of Rajasthan. I like it because it's, it's a lightweight sari. Uh, it's made in the Kota region of Rajasthan. That's where it gets its name from. And these are either pure cotton and silk fabric, uh, silk fabrics that feature a small checkered square patterns and are famed for their lightweight. So, Kota Doria weaving was introduced by the Mughals and machine-made Kota Doria saris have become quite common today. Another beautiful sari from the Western region of India is the Patan Patola. So Gujarat is known for its world famous double ikat patola from Patani. It is a colorful and ostentatious weave with its figured body along with the subtle merging of one shade into another. The pallu is about one to one and a half meter gold band and the border is four inches to six inches wide. It is woven in silk. The saris are generally worn on auspicious and important occasions and are very expensive sometimes costing up to rupees 2 lakhs. So once worn only by 
uh, those belonging to royal and ar aristocratic families, this textile is now popular among those who can afford the high prices. Patola weaving is a closely guarded family tradition. There are only three families. Uh, there are only three families in Patan that weave these highly prized double ikat saris. Uh, it is said that this technique is taught to no one in the family except to the sons. And it is renowned for its colorful diversity and geometrical style. It can take six months to a year to make one sari due to its long process of dyeing each strand separately before weaving them together. Patola is also woven in, in some villages of Surendranagar and Rajkot district. However, these single ikat pat patterns, which are simpler and more economical than the intricate ones of pattern. So pattern is a double ikat uh, and more expensive, whereas the other varieties in Surendranagar and Rajkot are a single ikat pattern. Another one of my favorites is the Chanderi Sari. So I thought of including it here. It has borrowed its name from the small town of Chanderi in Madhya Pradesh. The specialty of Chanderi is finely woven fabric into zari work on it. Two types of fabrics are used in Chan uh, Chanderi. It's either made in cotton or silk or a combination of both. And the fabric is woven with very fine hand spun yarn, which makes it delicate and lightweight at the same time. Motifs used in Chanderi work depict nature, mostly with leaves, flowers, trees, earth, sky, and the Ashrafi or the gold coin. Uh, they are very appropriate in summer wear for their lightweight, sober colors and its glossy transparency. The Bhagalpuri Sari, is um, sometimes referred to as the tassel saris, are woven in a small town called Bhagipur in Bihar. And it's, it's known, this place is known for its tassel silk saris. And apart from varieties of silk, the fact that it is an environment friendly, limited number of silk worms are used during the production of the silk. So due to this reason, Bakalpuri silk is sometimes referred to as pea silk. Another very unique sari is this piece from West Bengal called the Banuchiri sari. It's uh, an elaborately woven brocade made in the village um, surrounding ba Baluchar. It is popular because of its artistic and unique design. In the past, it was worn by the Nawabs and aristocracy. They have a very wide pallu with a panel of mango or paisley motifs at the center, surrounded by small rectangles depicting different scenes, like you can see in the picture of the pallu here. The borders were narrow with floral and uh, floral motifs, and the fall was covered with. Uh, small floral designs and bright colors. The unique feature is the combination of animal and bird motifs with floral and paisley motifs and motif, motifs depicting hunters on horses and elephants and scenes from the Nawab's court. The silk yarn used for Baluchar, uh, Baluchar saris was not twisted and had a very soft, heavy texture. And uh, there, were a, there were very limited colors used for the ground. Then I'd like to talk about the Jamdani Sari again from West Bengal. The Jamdani is, is the most advanced hand weaving technique in the world. The traditional art of weaving Jamdani was declared a UNESCO intangible cultural heritage of humanity in 2013. Originally, the base for the Jamdani technique was muslin, the finest cloth ever woven by human hand. It was said to be so fine that an entire sari could pass through a signet ring. Most of this art was lost in the 18th century when the East India Company started its systematic destruction of the Indian textile industry. While Jamdani began as cotton muslin, its weaves have incorporated threads of silk 
silver, gold, and more today. Jamdani is done on various materials without involving machinery. The sari takes anywhere between six months to three years to weave, where a pair of weavers uh, weaves for 10 hours a day. This is a Paitani sari of Maharashtra. It's named after the Paitan town in Aurangabad in Maharashtra, where it is hand woven uh, and fine silk saris. These fine silk saris are considered one of the richest saris in India. Once worn only by royals and aristocrats, today Paitani saris hold a treasured place in the place in the trousseau of a Maharashtrian bride. A genuine handloom Paitani sari uses about 500 grams of silk thread and another 250 grams of zari thread for a regular six yard sari. Nine yard saris obviously use more raw materials and the entire process of weaving and completing a Paitani sari can take anywhere from a month to two years. While Paitani saris often feature booties on the body, the highlight is always a border and pallu, which consists of motifs like peacocks, lotus, parrots, flowers, wines, and mango shapes, kairi, kairi they call it. And since they are dyed by weavers using vegetable dyes, these saris come in basic colors like red, yellow, blue, purple, peach, pink, green, and magenta. Passed on from one generation to another, these heirloom saris can cost anywhere from uh, rupees 7,000 to two and a half lakhs, depending on the silk thread and zari work on the border, which is, which is usually drawn from real gold or silver. Paitani saris have been facing competition from Paloom Paitanis, which look as good as handwoven saris and are sold at high prices despite being produced at one tenth the cost. One of the telltale signs of a genuine Paitani sari is that the weave looks exactly the same on both sides. Whereas on Paloom saris, one can see threads on the reverse. Because of the manual nature of the weaving process, no two Paitanis are exactly the same. There will there'll always be a minute variation in design. A genuine Paitani doesn't lose its luster or wear out at folds. The next one is our very own Kunbi sari that I'd like to talk about. It's a 100% it's cotton sari, which is woven by the Kunbi and Gauda tribes of Goa. It is, it is characterized by its checks woven on a red, blue, or black base and a double row of dobby design at the border. Kunbi is a farmer's tribe who cultivated paddy fields, so the sari was uniquely designed to enable women to work freely in the fields. It is a four to five yard sari and shorter in width, so it doesn't fully cover the legs. The weave is strong and sturdy, so it doesn't wear easily. The red saris were used for celebrations and blue saris were used by young widows. Checks of the saris are dyed in few colors, red, yellow, white, and green. And darker shades of maroon, purple, and black is also used. The colors are known to signify different stages of life, like youth, marriage, old age, and death. In the past, the dyes that were used, uh, these colors were extracted naturally from dyeing, dye yielding plants available in Goa and surrounding areas, but currently chemical dyes are used to dye them. The, de the demand for these saris had declined over the years due to colonization and stereotyping. However, in recent years, it has made a comeback with its growing popularity, especially among sari enthusiasts. <laughs> then, then we have the Kasau Sari of Kerala. The white and gold saris are unique due to their natural hues, texture, and the gold border, which adds to their elegance. No occasion in Kerala feels complete without the Kasavu costume. The Indian government has identified three clusters in Kerala, Balrampuram, Chendamangalam, and Kutampulli that have been given a 
geographical indication tags and all three clusters produce kasavu saris. The typical handwoven sari is made with fineness of count in weaving, uses 100% unbleached cotton, but it also evolved with the passage of time and is made using cotton and silk both. The plain sari with a simple border takes roughly around three to five days. Once, ones with motives and heavier work take longer than that. The saris are priced depending on the time taken on its production along with the gold used for the zari or kasari. The Kanjivaram sari is manufactured in the town of Kanchipuram in Tamil Nadu. They were manufactured um, as gifts to goddesses. Hence, initially, they were smaller in width and made of pure gold. The sari is sold depending upon its weight, which is directly related to the amount of silk and gold used. A sari can weigh up to two kilos due to its use of pure gold and silver threads. Kanchipuram saris uh, got its geographical indication by the government of India in 2005. It is worn on auspicious and special occasions and is a favorite for South Indian brides. An average sari is nine yards, but it can be a six yard sari as well. Originally, border of the sari was 10 to 15 inches, but nowadays it is made in five to 12 inches. Pallu is one to one and a half yard uh, wide and and both are decorated with zari. Typical motifs used in this sari are the sun, moon, chariots, swans, peacocks, parrots, lions, coins, mangoes, and leaves. These saris are usually made in dark colors such as red, saffron, orange, brown, green, maroon, peacock blue, and dark pink with bright contrasting borders. The body of the sari can be plain, checkered, or striped. They have booties at regular intervals, apart from regular border. It has an additional temple border, which is, which is a must for the saris that are offered to the goddess. In, in a Kanjivaram silk sari, the body and border are woven separately and they are interlocked together. The joint is woven so strongly that even if the sari tears, the border will not detach. That differentiates the Kanjivaram silk saris from all other saris. So I've covered most of the I've covered most of the saris that I uh, that I admire across India, the weaves, I mean, and I would like to cover the drapes. Um, so when you Think of the Indian drapes, it's a common misconception that a sari can be draped in only one way. The truth is that there are hundreds of different ways to drape a sari. Most of the drape styles are regionally specific and a result of context, geog geography, and function. Although the sari is a versatile garment, a lot of people shy away from wearing it because they believe it's difficult to wear and they may not be wearing it correctly. To be clear, there's no correct way of wearing a sari. One can wear it any way they like. You can ask the millions of women who wear it on a daily basis. Some people tend to pin up the sari in various places, but this, this is not required. In fact, too many safety pins in a sari can give it a rigid look. The sari transcends socioeconomic divisions and is seen as an egalitarian garment. In fact, a recent in recent times, many men are also adopting the sari. The sari was not worn in the way we see it today. Before the British rule, the sari was worn to cover the lower torso, the, the lower part of the body, and, and it was worn bare on the top without a sari blouse. It was during the Victorian era that bearing one's chest or being blouseless was seen as improper. And it was the British Raj that promoted wearing a blouse and petticoat with uh, ruffled hems. 
As a result, even today, people wear the sari with the blouse and petticoat, but none of the regional drapes actually require a petticoat, and many can be worn without a blouse. This brings me to the way we think of the sari drape, the most common drape, which is a navy drape. Uh, it, it's, it is tucked, it is pleated and tucked in at the waist. leader and influencer of the time and also the sister-in-law of Rabindranath Tagore. Political leaders wore this drape to distinguish themselves from the British and also give the independence movement a national identity. The point, the point of the style was to fit, the point of the style was to fit in while marking a distinct Indian identity. Another illustrious figure known to have popularized his draping style was artist Raja Ravi Verma. The Nivi drape was depicted throughout his paintings by modifying a South Indian sari known as Mundam Neriyakum. And this brings me to the Nirmala Mata, which is seen at the Museum of Christian Art. This statue, uh, which looks heavily influenced by Raja Ravi Verma's painting of the Hindu goddess Lakshmi, can be seen in the Nivi drape. The renowned Indian painter had chosen this drape of the sari as the ideal female garb. So the drape depicts femininity and motherhood, similar to Raja Ravi Verma's paintings of the Indian subcontinent as the mother wearing the Nivi drape sari. Another drape, uh, the Nibi drape was actually inspired by this drape, which is called a Sida Palla. This drape is worn in states of Gujarat and Uttarakhand, as well as Uttar Pradesh. The pallu is draped over the right shoulder from the back to front. And it starts with one end of the sari tucked into the waistband of the petticoat and wrapped around the lower body. And the pleat, it's pleated evenly and tucked into the petticoat waistband below the navel. The Pasi drape of Gujarat, known as the Gol Sari drape, is similar except that the pallu is thrown much lower and closer to the lower border. So, um, so the uh, Nanata Nandini Devi was inspired by this drape um, to when she created the the, the very popular Nivi drape. The the next drape I'd like to talk to is closer home, the Dethli, which is that of the Goan Kunbi and Gauda tribes. It is, it is a flared drape from the waist down. And since the width of the sari is short, it doesn't fully cover the legs. A separate blouse wasn't really required for this as it draped in such a way that it covered the chest and was knotted on the right shoulder. The pallu was sometimes folded in front and tucked in at the waist to form a sort of pouch or a pocket. And this is how the women wore it when they were working in fields or doing household chores or when they went to the market so they could put their coin, coin bags into that little pouch that they formed with their pallu. When, when attending church or temple ceremonies, the drape took a more conservative, a conservative turn with it being worn longer, slightly above the ankles and the women would uh, lose the pocket in front. Another similar drape to the Deathly is, is the Halaki Vokalika. The drape, is, the drape is traditionally worn by the agriculturist communities of Karnataka. And 
just like other working class sari drapes, it attaches importance to the ease of movement for the wearer. It is distinguished by its pleats concealed with a smooth outer drape. The sari is draped by forming clusters of sari uh, of sorry of three small pleats each and tucking it around the waist in an anti-clockwise direction. The pleats are then spread out and the drape is thus appearing like a pleated skirt. Traditionally, the pallu is taken across the chest, brought from back in front over the right shoulder and knotted over the right shoulder. Then you, um, you have the Odissi dance pants, which, has, which originated in central and eastern Orissa. This is actually a dance Sambalpuri sari, uh, a sari dress. And it's a uh, brightly colored, it's usually in a brightly colored sari offset by black or red blouse called a kanchula. It's also known as a kacha. Kacha, this uh, pant-like style is a combination of contemporary and traditional uh, design. It, it has earned a lot of popularity in recent times with many celebrities adopting the style. It is very comfortable to wear, wherein the wearer can move their legs freely, enabling them to ride a bike or even climb a tree. The sari is wrapped around the waist from the middle and knotted at the waist in the front. And the left portion of the sari is drawn between the legs to the back and the edges tucked along the left waist. The right half is then drawn between the legs and tucked in at the center back. And lastly, the pallu is draped front to back over the left shoulder. You have the kur drape, which is a toga-like drape. And um, it's from Karnataka. It, it's a formal drape worn by the upper class uh, women of Kurk, which shows off the pallu. It's worn in such a way that it shows off the pallu. The pleats are tucked in at the waist at the center back and the pallu is drawn under the right arm over the left shoulder and secured with a knot on the right shoulder. The style is generally draped in a nine yard sari. This is one of the most, this is, I like the style. It's one of my favorites and also very interesting style. It's called the Bokli Posi Kattu Kodam Drape. It's also known as the pocket sari. This is a grand drape worn by the Gola shepherd community and the Gudati Kapulu agriculturists of Southern Andhra Pradesh. This drape requires a nine yard sari and the center front pleats of the drape are lifted and tucked at the back, forming pockets on either side. So I, uh, before I wind up, I just wanted to say that I, you know, um, I just wanted to say that the drapes, uh, Indian drapes don't have to be uh, you know, you don't have to stick to just wearing a sari in a particular way. An Indian sari can be draped into pants, they can be made into shorts, they can be made into a skirt, a jumpsuit, a toga, a dress. Uh, there are multiple ways of wearing a sari. And um, there's, um, I mean, I think there are over 100 recorded um, sari drapes in India, which I couldn't cover all today. Uh, another thing is a sari is a much loved uh, piece of garment, which is heirloom. It, it's an heirloom that is passed down from uh, generation to generation. And if there are, uh, if you want to see more drapes and how they are done, how they, how a sari is draped in the various uh, regional drapes as well, you can look it up on something called the sari series online. Um, yeah, and if you have anything to ask me, I am happy to take your questions now. Ninashka, thank you for taking us on this uh, wonderful journey 
on the sari weaves of India and as well as the different drapes. Uh, I did not know that there were so many that you shared with us. And then, as you said, you know, there must be so many more and uh, as well as each one can do their own take on the sari. Um, I will now request the audience if they have any questions for Ninoshka to either you can put it on the chat box or you can unmute yourselves one by one. We prefer you put it in the chat box first and then we can take it up and you can ask the question to Ninoshka. But you'll need to uh, tell us that you have a question because then I'll have to unmute you. Aarti Das, do you believe uh, Aarti? Just a minute, Aarti. Aarti, you can unmute yourself and ask Nanoshka the question. You'll need to unmute yourself. Okay. Can you hear now? Yeah. Hi, Aarti. Like, uh, do you believe that uh, wearing of sari among uh, women or mainly women, is it declining or is it like a, a urban belief? Because uh, in rural parts of India, people, women still wear sari. So just like a uh, really comment on that. No, like, like I mentioned, you know, it's, it's a common misconception that the uh, sari has to be worn in a certain way. And most people, they think, oh, I can't wear the sari because it's so difficult and it's so uncomfortable. And, you know, I, if I go to work, I have to handle it this way and that way, which, which they don't need to. You wear the sari the way you are comfortable wearing it. And uh, the reason why people shy away from wearing a sari is because of that. They feel they might not be comfortable enough wearing it. Like I said, you can wear the sari any way you like. You can wear it as a pant. You can wear it in shorts. As a as shorts, I've got a friend who runs uh, marathons wearing a sari, and she she drapes it like shorts. Um, so you can wear it the way you're comfortable. And a lot of youth are adopting these different draping techniques. They're styling it in a different way. Uh, they they're wearing it on t-shirts or on. Uh, blouse, you know, they don't have to wear a sari blouse. They can wear it on t-shirts. They can wear jackets over it. They can wear it on uh, pustiers, um, on tank tops. So they're they're finding new ways of wearing a sari. And I think the awareness has to be there that, you know, you don't have to wear a sari in a typical navy uh, drape. You can wear it in different drapes and still be comfortable wearing it. I hope that answers your question. Thanks, Aarti, for that question. Uh, yes. Marissa has a question for you. Uh, Aarti, uh, I hope that answers your question to a, to a certain extent. <laughs> uh, yes, yes. Yeah, okay. Thanks, Aarti. Uh, Nerissa has a question for you. Nerissa, do you want to ask it or can we take it from here? Uh, can you tell us something about Northeast drapes? Yunoshka, that is for you. Uh, northeast drapes. Uh, northeast is actually uh, very. Um, it's well known for its silks. So you have the uh, muga silk, which is the most expensive silk. Uh, it's known as. Um, it's actually the price of a muga silk sari can be equivalent to your gold jewelry. I mean, the women they actually um, treasure their muga silk saris the way they would treasure their gold jewelry. So it's, they're very, very expensive. Muga silk, actually Muga means gold. And you have the Eri silk, which is uh, the Ahimsa silk. Um, the non-violent silk where it's, you know, the, the silk is made out of the, silk. Then after the silk worm leaves the cocoon. So uh, those, that's a much cheaper, that's a poor man's silk. You have these two types of silks, and these are the most common silks in uh, silk saris in Northeast India, in Assam. Okay. Um, Rupali, you can unmute yourself. I think you have a question for uh, Ninoshka. If you'd like to unmute yourself and ask the question, Rupali, Rupali Lal. Yeah. Hello, Ninoshka. Uh, hello, I'm Rupali. Rupali. I have uh, many. Hello. I have many yes, yes. Uh, traditional saris. 
most of them yeah. are not very they are not the high end one you know so i but like uh, they have got damaged some somewhere because of like i have used them many times so okay. i wanted to know like uh, you know what can i do with those borders and all they are actually very beautiful and okay. uh, i don't want to stitch salwar kameez because you know that is like uh, going to be way too expensive okay so you can so you can i wanted move to know you know like any way we can use these borders and the pallu you can remove the borders and pallus and actually stitch it on another fabric to make a whole new sari if you are if you are a sari wearer and you want to okay. make sarees only you want to keep it as a sari then you can use it for uh, i mean you can remove the borders and the pallu and you can stitch it all over again on another piece of fabric that and and make a whole new sari out of it you can even change the colors color of the body you know so if okay. you don't want it to be a sari you can make other items you not if not salwar kameez then there are other items that you can make you can i i, I don't know what you are into but it depends on what you use and what you would treasure the most but then it can always be converted into a sari again with the borders and the okay and this this idea i didn't have that it can be put on a different fabric and make made into a different sari yeah thank yeah, you very I, much yeah but thanks rupali for your question uh, we all know uh, savni has a collection of sarees and she asks the question how many sarees are too many sarees in modding savni Uh, if you have any more questions, you are, you can unmute yourself, and then Ashka will answer that. <laughs> yeah, that was a very casual question, and I don't think anybody has any answer to that. Uh, you can never have. You can never have uh, enough sarees. I mean, <laughs> I I, I can... have one. Uh, uh, I mean the. first of all nishkar is a very interesting lecture and i think a lot of people get confused between what is a drape what is a view and you know like sometimes okay. what is an embroidery or different okay. types of uh, em- embellishments on the sarees like you can have a tassar uh, sari will kalamkari on it and it adds to mm-hmm. all the confusion i think you segmented it very nicely for even uh, somebody if they have been like a complete novice it would have been very interesting for them to understand because the world is, the sari world is very huge so i yeah. really compliment you on that because you made it very clear and simple for everyone and uh, to understand what is a view what is a drape and everything uh, and, and i'm like yeah it was a interesting collection also of important sarees from different parts of india so <laughs> congratulations on very interesting lecture i think this can be done uh, at the museum with actual sarees because the best part of the sari is the feel yeah that's yeah. right actually on, i i i wasn't sure i wasn't sure if vana would be enough because there's so much on sarees and i have only covered the weaves there there are also embroideries there are um, there are other crafts like you have block printed sarees you have from rajasthan you have the uh, different block prints then you have the embroideries like you have chicken kari sarees you have got zardosi sarees from up then uh, you have like the kantha sarees from bengal so if i go into embroideries and different you have the dyeing techniques of gujarat and rajasthan the laheria and the bandhani sarees i mean those are dyeing techniques and you have a whole different uh, list of sarees there itself so it's endless you know so i have just covered a very small part of sarees that is just the weaves and that two very few selected weaves yes and yeah and the drapes are hundreds which we, which would be impossible i mean you even have the navari drape of um, maharashtra which i did not include in my presentation uh, there are many many wave uh, drapes as well so i would suggest it to natasha ma'am if she could do uh, this in her, you know something like an offline activity because the best part of the textile is the feel of it so they can take it up as a museum activity some because uh, the museum collection also has very interesting textiles i mean of course you can't touch it now but the old uh, you know costumes also have a very beautiful zari so 
Thanks, Savni, for that uh, very valid suggestion. We will, uh, we hope we can do an offline session dedicated to sarees, like you pointed out, uh, to feel the textile, to feel the different uh, types of uh, weaves is very important. And hopefully, um, someday soon, we can invite Ninoshka and some others to share their, yeah. uh, you know, uh, the various... Uh, on various topics, think, it can be on weaves, it can be on embroideries and uh, a range of things, even the dyeing techniques, like Minoshka just said, the dyeing techniques uh, of, uh, of some of the weaves from some of the parts of the country can also be discussed. So yes, your well uh, noted, Savni, your suggestion for an offline session sometime soon. I think everyone can come with their own collection of saris and we can all exchange ideas and we can all get a feel of all different types of sarees from each other yes it will be really a wonderful uh, session if we can do that uh, hopefully soon and uh, we'll definitely keep everybody informed so i uh, i think there are no more questions and i would like to thank you uh, Ninoshka, on behalf of team moka for uh, you know uh, Taking the F, making the effort to put all this together, like Savni said, uh, it was a very, uh, very detailed and yet very crisp presentation that you made. Uh, it helped us all understand the sari better. It, uh, you know, for a person who knows a lot about saris, as well as for people who are, uh, you know, totally new to the topic on saris. So thanks very much, Ninoshka. Uh, very grateful and thank you to all our participants for uh, always being very supportive joining our sessions uh, on various topics that we choose to, to talk about and we will keep you all informed we have many more events coming up this month we uh, if you're following us on instagram and facebook or if you're on our events group uh, you will be uh, shortly getting notified on the various activities and events at mocha uh, and please if you have not yet reached MOCA after it has been reopened, we invite you all to, to visit. And those who have come, please come again with your family and friends. So thank you and have a great weekend. Thank, thank you so you. much for having me. Yeah, and we thank can you. look, we can do something maybe in the future on yes, the uh, definitely, sari definitely. drapes, perhaps. Take workshop. it from here and we'll uh, have a, definitely have an offline session. Thank you, okay. everyone. Bye, Ninoshka. Thank you so much. Yeah. Bye. Bye.